Um, again, we'll be taking questions at the end for a panel. If you think of questions in the meantime, either jot them down so that you don't forget them, or this session is also being webcast. If you want to uh, email a question to sages 2011session 4 at gmail.com, we'll get them up here on, on the podium. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Patricia Roberts, who is professor of surgery at Tufts University and chair of the Department of Colon and Rectal Surgery at Leahy Clinic, and a, a long history of working with the American Board of Colon and Rectal Surgery, which is a colorectal surgeon certifying board. Thank you. Thank you, Tonya. Um, I'd like to just start off by polling the audience. Uh, how many are US surgeons, if you can raise your hand? So most of the audience, and how many people perform laparoscopic colon surgery? So once again, most of the audience, and uh, it's interesting that what's happening around the rest of the country is quite different. So I've been charged to look at the rate of adoption of laparoscopic colectomy in the United States, and laparoscopic colectomy was first introduced in the 1990s, and after the initial enthusiasm about the procedure, this was tempered because of port site recurrences, concerned about oncologic results, and concerned about adequate lymphadenectomy. Uh, so it basically, there was almost a moratorium on laparoscopic colectomy pending the results of the cost trial. And the cost trial uh, certainly confirmed equivalent oncologic outcome and benefits, as you've heard, in terms of length of stay, cosmesis, and patient recovery. So where are we now, two decades beyond the introduction of laparoscopic colectomy and seven years after the introduction of the results of the cost trial? So what I'd like to do is to look at the adoption rate among all US surgeons, to look at the adoption rate of specialty surgeons, particularly colon and rectal surgeons, and to look at the adoption rate of individual surgeons after laparoscopic courses. And just to put this into context, if we look at early survey data after the first decade of laparoscopic surgery, uh, this is from Steve Wexner and his group, early adoption rates, and this was a questionnaire survey of all North American members of SAGES and ASCARS. 48% actually at that time were performing laparoscopic colectomies, so almost 50% at the end of the 90s, and they were performing it in about 20% of their patients, mainly because they were withholding it for curable colon cancer pending the cost trial. These were high volume surgeons performing more than 70 abdominal colorectal procedures a year. And if we fast forward now to 2011, the situation throughout the country is, is fairly different. Uh, this is uh, data was presented by Jennifer Ray and Dan Herzig last year at the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons meetings, and I thank them for uh, uh, giving me a copy of their paper and their presentation. And they used the nationwide inpatient sample, which is the largest all-payer database of discharges in this country. Uh, it looks at all payers, Medicare, Medicaid, self-insured, private insurance, and is about 8 million discharges a year and 20% of hospitals. So it's a good sample of US discharge data. And they looked at two cohorts, 2001 to 2003, so before the cost trial, and 2005 to 2007, after the cost trial. And what they found, well, they looked at uh, all patients who had had colon operations, so right colectomy, sigmoid colectomy, left colectomy, total abdominal colectomy, yellow rectal anastomosis. Patients were all over 18, all elective admissions, and they classified patients on the basis of malignant disease, benign disease, and they also had data on the conversion rate uh, and uh, on the complication rate. Over that time period, there were about three quarters of a million colectomies, and as you can see in the aggregate, 92% were performed open, 8% were performed laparoscopic. And if we look specifically at the cases, the uh, x-axis is the year of surgery, the y-axis, the percent of cases performed laparoscopically. In total, starting off, 4% were done laparoscopically and a little over 10% at the end of 2007, the last year for which data was available from the nationwide inpatient sample. Looking at benign disease, about 6% initially and about 12% at the end of 2007, and for cancer, going from 2% to 9%. So the curves started to converge for cancer and benign disease, but the 
incidence of laparoscopic colectomy for cancer still lagged behind. So in 2007, patients were four times more likely to have a, colectomy, a laparoscopic colectomy for cancer than, for, uh, than they were in 2001, and for benign disease, two times more likely to have a laparoscopic colectomy than they were in 2001, but still the numbers were quite low. And what was really very sobering was the conversion rate. This actually increased over the study period from 28% to 36%, and the complication rate also increased, raising questions as to who should be doing these procedures. So based on this study, laparoscopic resection for colon cancer and benign disease is really increasing quite slowly. Almost 90% of the cases in this country are still performed open, at least as of 2007. And utilization has its disparities, and it's influenced by various socioeconomic factors. Poor, uninsured women and patients in rural hospitals were less likely to undergo laparoscopic colectomy. Well, what about the adoption rate for specialty training or colorectal trainees? And these are ACGME fellowships. I don't have data on non-ACGME fellowships uh, or on MIS fellowships. Uh, colorectal surgery is a fairly uh, uh, popular residency. Uh, we currently have um, 89 positions in 56 training programs. Uh, we've had an uh, increase in the number of training programs and the number of applicants, but still a relatively small specialty with about 1,400 board-certified colon and rectal surgeons. And you've seen data that uh, Dr. Marks presented regarding the American Board of Colon and Rectal Surgery uh, data for laparoscopic resections. The board database has been operational since 1989. And you can see we've really had a tipping point around 2004 after the cost trial, such that uh, uh, more and more resections for diverticulitis are performed laparoscopically. There's been a real increase in uh, use of laparoscopic surgery for inflammatory bowel disease and for colorectal cancer. And if we split this for uh, colon cancer from a start of 5% to about 41% in 2005, and for diverticular disease, 6% to about 45% uh, in 2005. So as Dr. Marks talked about, a real tipping point. But the small number of specialty trained surgeons and the large number of colon and rectal procedures raise certain issues in terms of who should be performing the, these procedures, what sort of training should we have. Uh, and this is data from David Edzioni looking at all of the colorectal procedures in this country, matching it with UPIN numbers in terms of who does these procedures. And you can see that there's been a steady increase uh, of procedures done by specialty trained surgeons so that about one-third of proctectomies are done by colonorectal surgeons and about 15% of colectomies. And this has some important implications as we look forward. About 250,000 colectomies in this country each year, 51,000 proctectomies, and an increase forecast over the next two decades of anywhere between 21 and 43%. And some of the other speakers will be addressing this in terms of centers of excellence. Well, what about the adoption rates of individual surgeons who take courses and then go out to do laparoscopic colectomy? SAGES and American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons have had a number of hands-on courses at their annual meeting. Uh, this looks at survey data from all participants of hands-on courses from 2003 to 2005. Uh, this is data that uh, Howard Ross and Peter Marcello put together. 25 question survey looking at practice setting, prior laparoscopic experience, motivation to take the course, and the time to indications for and the type of the first laparoscopic colectomy performed and in addition, factors facilitating skills acquisition and the impact on practice from course completion. Uh, the study had a 68% response rate, and of those individuals taking the course, 47% had no prior laparoscopic colon experience, 53% had done prior laparoscopic colectomies with a mode of prior experience of five. Following the course, the uh, first procedure that 60% of the participants did was a right colectomy. The most common indication was an unresectable polyp. Uh, over 50% used a hand-assisted technique for their first case, and almost two-thirds felt that knowledge of hand-assisted techniques lowered the threshold for performing their first lap colectomy. So this may be a bridge to increasing adoption of laparoscopic colectomy. Uh, of interest, only a very small percent had a preceptor present.
And if we look at adoption of the technology after course completion, 51% had performed a laparoscopic colectomy within the first week of course completion, 36% after one month, and an additional 10% or 100% of participants uh, after uh, six months. And if we look at the Im impact on practice and adoption in practice, uh, after taking the course, 3% did a laparoscopic colectomy more than once a week, 26% weekly, 61% monthly, and about 10% every three months. So laparoscopic cadaver courses uh, seem to be associated with rapid integration into clinical practice. And this certainly brings up questions as to how technology diffuses through society or how we adopt different innovations. And this has been extent extensively studied by Everett Rogers, who's at Iowa State University. He actually started looking at this in uh, seed purchases uh, of hybrid corn by farmers and looked at uh, various socio sociologic uh, and demographic demographic factors in terms of adopting new technology and felt that uh, any innovation needed to be better. Certainly laparoscopic colorectal surgery has advantages. It needed to be simpler. We can have some debate about that. The innovation needed to be proven, and it's been proven time and time again by a number of randomized clinical trials. There needed to be communication to transmit the innovation to other adopters. Time was required for the innovation to spread. Diffusion of technology also appears to follow a bell-shaped curve, and there are innovators, early adopters, uh, those people in the early or late majority that need to wait for multiple, multiple trials, and then the laggards, those individuals who are probably the last one to do a laparoscopic colectomy, and I'd submit that this organization and ASCARS is probably in the innovators and early adopters, and what we're seeing throughout the rest of the country is really on the uh, left side of the curve over here, where this society is on the right side of the curve. And I think we can all look to uh, our partners and our institutions in terms of the innovators and uh, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and then perhaps some of the laggards. Um, so uh, in conclusion, despite favorable outcomes of laparoscopic versus open colectomy, the adoption rates are high in specialty groups, but really quite low overall. There are a number of causes that have been alluded to by Dr. Marks, longer operating times, the learning curve, procedure volume. And as we look to increase adoption of the technology, we'll need to look on how we train people. We'll need to look at surgical specialization, technical, technical capabilities, and economic incentives or disincentives to perform the procedure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pat.